Hi everyone, welcome to the third session of the eight week series of the Taping Your Movement brought to you by Elastoplast. All sessions are free and will be led by industry professionals from a variety of sporting backgrounds. Thanks for your attendance. Uh, my name is Paul Tucker and I'll be presenting tonight's session. Um, a little bit of my background. I've spent the last 20 years at West Coast Eagles Football Club working as a, a senior physiotherapist. Um, I finished up at the end of last season after COVID um, had a fairly hefty hit on the club. Um, and before that, I was uh, operating at uh, various sort of professional soccer, rugby league, and a little bit of state-based um, swimming and athletics teams. Um, at the moment, uh, I work for uh, my own organisation called City and South Physio, and I consult uh, up here in Perth at uh, West Coast Health and High Performance, as well as Western Kids Health. And I'm also working, fortunately enough, down at a place called VAS in our southwest at uh, Latitude 33.7 Physio. So enough about me. Uh, today's session, I'm going to be talking or focusing on acute upper limb sporting injuries, basically elbow, wrist, thumb and finger. And my main emphasis is going to be on the taping that I've used over the years to manage a lot of these types of injuries. Um, session will go for about 45 minutes. Um, but before we start, we've got a couple of housekeeping things I, I need to work through. So the housekeeping, we have two uh, Lesterplast representatives controlling today's session. And if you have any uh, questions, please direct them to them on the chat forum. Also, because we have so many people in today's session, everyone will remain on mute uh, until such time as uh, Todd will open it up for some questions. If you have a question in question time, please virtually raise your hand and uh, Todd or one of the other representatives will take you off mute to ask the question. Uh, and finally, uh, we wish to end with a disclaimer. Uh, with any of the products that you see me use today, I always read the label, follow the instructions for use, and if any symptoms persist, please talk to your health professional. Um, probably as a last thing, I'd just like to thank uh, Josh, who will be my patient today, for coming in and giving up his time. All right, let's get into it. So I'm going to start with the elbow. And from an acute perspective, uh, one of the most, probably the two most common things that I've seen, uh, especially when it comes to contact sport, are a hyperextension injury, where that could be from a fall or perhaps in a contest where someone has their arm forced backwards from the front and then obviously it might get caught between a couple of bodies. So you can end up with a pure hyperextension injury in that case. Um, the other one that we often see is some sort of medial collateral ligament injury, again, often with an outstretched arm, perhaps trying to tackle an opponent. And that sort of uh, injury relates or can result in either a medial collateral ligament injury specifically, uh, and sometimes it can in, uh, entail some sort of damage to the, the common uh, flexor origin. So the taping that I'll do today can be adapted to either the hyperextension or to the medial ligament. It just very much depends on where you wish to put the support, but the principles are exactly the same. So for this tape, I'm actually going to use some elasto wrap, almost as an under wrap, just to protect the really sensitive parts of uh, the elbow on the skin. You can use either the 50 or the 38 mil rigid tape, depends on what your kit has in entailed, uh, sorry, what your kit has in it. Um, obviously bigger bodies, um, I tend to use the 50, but for some smaller athletes or perhaps for kids, you can use the 38 mil rigid for this. Over the top, we finally finish off with the 75 mil EAB. So I'm just going to run through the tape now with Josh. 
So we just start with the strip of the 38, uh, sorry, of the um, 10 centimetre Luco wrap. And just peel that off. And for this, I actually get Josh to keep his arm fully extended. And we just place that to the front of the elbow. And again, if you're doing the medial, more of a medial tape, you'll tend to put the tape perhaps a little bit more medially than this. I'm going to use the 50 mil rigid as a starting point for Josh. I'm going to put two anchors on, one below the elbow, and it's just a half circumferential tape. And then one above the, end, the elbow where you can get someone just to flex up a little bit. So it doesn't become too tight. And again, if you can just see Josh's elbow there, we haven't gone all the way around. It's just your two anchor points. Okay. For the pure hyperextension tape, I will then run three tapes directly down front of his elbow. So just, just get, I always get him to bend a little bit. And we just lay these tapes on. between the two anchor points. The degree of flexion, I suppose, in the elbow depends very much on yeah, the type of sport that someone's playing. Um, or secondly, yeah, how far into their range you're trying to limit them depending on how painful it is through the back of their elbow. But again, if we sort of show you there with Josh, it's basically overlapping each of the, the tapes just so that you are stopping that, almost acting as a bowstring effect through the front of his elbow. Right, to finish it off with the rigid, do a couple of crossover tapes. Okay, and basically these crossovers uh, prevent the tape that I've laid down the front of his elbow from bowstringing up as he straightens out. So they're almost like a locking tape. Okay, so again, we sort of show you that a little bit closer. You can see it's just a crisscross through there, again, just to help prevent that tape from uh, lifting up as he straightens his elbow. Now, the main difference between this, and I'll put it on here now, is if I was doing the medial part of his elbow, um, I put that rigid tape on it in a slightly you know, different way. All right. Look, and occasionally too, you get someone that you wish to prevent the hyperextension as well as that sort of, um, I suppose, pelvic stress on his elbow. So in this case, my crossover, my rigid, would be more down the inside. And again, two or three tapes through there. And my crossover just moves around to the inside of his elbow rather than across the front.
Okay, so it's just that slight difference of um, if I tried to resist or tried to open Josh up on the inside of the elbow there, that the tape is actually going to stop that versus if I was going to try and stop a hyperextension, same thing, you're trying to get the tape to actually do that job of stopping him straightening right out. Once the rigid tape's on and he keeps his arm bent, I then finish off with a 75 mil EAB, starting on the inside, do a crossover, and this is where I tend to put a little bit of tension on the tape as it crosses the front of the elbow. Comes around here. Not too tight around here, again, circulation. Trying to make that too uncomfortable for him. And then come back as a figure eight across the anterior part of his elbow. And lock that off like that. So again, if you can have a look, it's just a figure eight across the front. If it was the medial um, ligament that I was trying to protect more than the hyperextension, that figure eight again just shifts more across to the inside part of his elbow. Let's cut that off. And again, my preference is to finish the tape on the outside of his arm so that as he's running or doing any sport, if it was to catch, um, it's less likely to peel up and come off. And then just finish with some rigid tape I'll show you in a moment, but basically just on the outside where that loose edge is, again, just tends to stop the elastic getting loose once he's running around doing his sport. Okay. All right, so uh, again, if anyone's got any questions on, on the elbow tape, um, please have a look towards the end of the presentation and flick those questions through to, to Todd at Elastoplast. Okay, if we move down the body now to the wrist, uh, again, one of the more common ones that I see in contact sport especially is a wrist extension type injury where either someone's fallen um, and perhaps with a, another player on their back or, or tackling them, um, or alternatively, uh, for over eastern states there, you might have a bit more of the old fend-off type injury, although it does happen in the AFL too, um, where someone goes to push off and their wrist is obviously forced backwards. Um, obviously, one of the things you need to rule out are things like fractures and, and any significant damage to, to the ligaments in the wrist. But if it's in the acute setting and you do have someone that wants to go back out onto the, onto the ground, and they feel a lot more comfortable with that wrist, I suppose, blocked from going into full extension, then this is the sort of taping that, that I tend to use. So this here is just a wrist, what I call a wrist block, uh, basically made up with about 10 layers of 38 mil rigid. Um, for some of the bigger players that we used to, I used to treat when I was downstairs at the Eagles, um, often I use the 50 mil. Uh, it just gives those really big, chunky wrists uh, a better block that you won't get with the 38. So basically, as I said, um, folding the tape over on itself roughly 10 times gives you enough padding here to sit in and do the block. The whole root, the whole um, area that we're trying to do is basically place it just above the wrist crease so that it actually acts in this way of stopping the wrist coming backwards. If you put it too low or too high, obviously you'll still get as much range in there as um, they have without the tape on. So my process is get some of these done. You get players to do them yourself, themselves so that you've got a nice bank of these sitting there and you don't have to waste all your time actually making up a block. Once you've got it, I'll get Josh back in. What we're trying to do here is actually just place it now. You can see the bump on the back of the wrist where his ulna um, process is or the end of his ulna bone sitting down here. You want to be roughly over the top of that and sit the tape there. If 
I'm using the 38, like this, I tend to go one straight over the top. Get Josh to make a fist, so as hard as you can. Again, you just want to get, not put this on too tightly from a circulation point of view, but it needs to be firm enough to sit and hold in place. And then come around. If you have a look underneath, someone once said to me, there's not too many parts on the human body that are perfect cylinders. So if you try and make this dead straight around there, you find it creases up. Whereas if you have it on a slight angle as you come around, you get a much better hold on the tape. So once we've got one on, one below. On that angle. So again, you have a look there. Just make sure it's not too tight. And then Josh can stay there. And then we go one above. Again, that slight overlap. And the thing is, if it gets a bit tight, you can put a little cut or a little rip in the tape at either end. It's not going to stop it. And again, if we turn over, bend your elbow like that. And if we're trying to stop full extension, you can see there that that blocks that without uh, putting a whole heap of tape on and so sort of really making his wrist quite thick and immobile. Once the rigid's on, tend to overlay it with a bit of elastic. Again, I'll go back to the 75 millimeter AAB. Again, make a fist. And just wrap that on fairly lightly and finish there. Again, we just have a look at the back. Sorry, getting myself mucked up. Um, so when we have a look at that, got the tape finishing at the back. And then again, just finish with one piece of the rigid 50 or 38 mil, finishing at the front like that. Okay, so I said basically a hyperextension of the wrist tape. If you've got someone who for some reason has overflexed their wrist, then you can use the same principle and just put it on the front of their wrist um, under the tape in exactly the same way I've done here for the extension. All right. One other benefit to this is if someone has got a thumb injury and we're doing a thumb tape, um, often they, they went sort of hand in hand, so I might have had a fall and injured the collateral ligament of their thumb as well as their wrist. Uh, you can combine this with your thumb tape, which I'll do in a moment, uh, and basically have the whole thing fairly protected from someone having a fall onto, onto that hand. All right, we move on now. Um, I'm going to talk about thumb. So one of the most common injury to the thumb is often the ulnar collateral ligament, which is basically on the inside part of the thumb closest to your index finger. And, and that's often where the thumb gets caught and pushed into that direction away from your palm often called skier's thumb. So you might see a few of those over in New South Wales and Victoria. Um, sadly, we don't see that many of them over here unless we find we've got our patients coming from the Golden Triangle who uh, manage to fly over there for their ski trip every season. So we often see it more with, um, I suppose, players who go to tackle and get their, their hand caught or their thumb caught that way. Um, However, I do see a number of radiocollateral ligament injuries, so basically on the palm, the far side of your thumb. And these are um, one of the sports I used to play was underwater hockey, and people often got their thumb forced back that way and open up the inside part of the, the thumb here. Um, and the final one, of course, is just a pure hyperextension of your thumb. And again, tends to be sore at the back. Um, with all these, I find the rigid tape 
and the elastic tape's a good combo to try and immobilise the thumb. However, for the skier's thumb type injury or, or the pure hyperextension, sometimes adding a piece of thermoplastic um, splinting underneath your thumb tape actually makes the thumb feel more secure. It's actually a lot more difficult to tape to prevent your thumb going that way than it is to stop it going that way. The hyperextension generally works okay, um, but again, with a lot of your ball sports, uh, with catching or even ball drop, players don't like to have too much over that thinner eminence of their thumb. So occasionally the taping for certain, you know, certain injuries can be a little bit problematic. Um, so, as I said, for me, the most effective one is for that uh, radiocollateral ligament where your standard thumb tape generally pulls the thumb away from the palm, almost in that sort of C shape or, or holding the can sort of shape when you're taping. So I'll run through that one today, but again, you can adapt it to uh, whatever you want to for your thumb. All right. So again, thinking about the orientation of the ligament where basically runs along here. So we want our tape to actually stop me being able to do that to his thumb. All right. So if I get Josh to hold his thumb in that position, again, that sort of C shape, uh, depending on the age of the people that you are dealing with, it could be holding a can. Um, a can of soft drink. And my first one, generally speaking, is from just below the distal joint, across the metacarpal phalangeal joint, and then attach. Now, at the moment, I'm lucky Josh has already got an anchor there for me, so I'll come onto that. If he didn't have any wrist tape on, I'd tend to put an anchor around here to hold the rigid in place, or at least give it a starting point. So I like doing things in threes. So we fan the tape out along the lines of the ligament. And just again, just below the joint, over the top, like that. Okay. Once you've got those in place, a very, very lightly applied anchor just below the knuckle. Um, you've had your thumb taped yourself. You know how easy it is for that, um, I suppose, your distal part of your thumb to end up feeling like it's a bit swollen or a bit uh, lacking in circulation. So when you put this one, this really is just laying it on. Again, on that slight crossover. And then we lock off the other end with a 38. Okay, so again, hopefully, what we find is that tape is now stopping him from being able to be forced too much that way. Finish off with your normal sort of um, 25 millimeter EAB. I always try, I always sometimes get this mucked up. So start thumb side from around the wrist, then cross over the back of his thumb here. Nice and light through the web space. So again, you're not trying to or you're trying to make sure you don't cut into that, make it uncomfortable. And then because I'm trying to protect this side, my crossover point is right at that part of his joint where I'm trying to prevent the most movement. And this is where I'll generally pull a little bit of, uh, or put a little bit of tension on the tape. So again, I'll just achieve a little bit more of support through that area. Hit the wrist again, come back, cross back over about half the width of the tape. 
This time, right around once. And being careful, this is not particularly tight because it is circumferential. Crisscross over again. Again, you should see that sort of pattern of uh, overlap. A little bit more tension there. Come around. And depending on your, on your tape budget, whether you're an amateur club or a professional club, throw one more on where we just reinforce those figure eights again. And again, you can see it just pull across through here. Okay, to finish this one off, you've got two options. One option is just to finish it off on the wrist, lock it off with another piece of 38 millimeter tape. However, my, my preference is to cut your 25 millimeter EAB on an angle, okay, just where the tape finishes. And then if you can tuck two bits of elastic tape together, Under there like that, that won't unravel because you've got the two glue bits end to end. Okay, so you won't see players running around trying to get a um, whole stream of tape hanging off their thumb. All right, so just finish it off that way, and it also um, requires, I suppose, less tape and less bulk around his wrist. Okay, so that's the thumb. Okay, so if we move on to, on to fingers, um, again, anyone who's been participated in any sort of uh, ball sport, generally speaking, has got, especially if you're my age, has got a couple of really, uh, I suppose, unfortunate looking fingers um, from perhaps being managed in different ways um, uh, from the acute management right through to I suppose the rehab and the um, ongoing, I suppose, protection of those joints as you've gone through your sporting career. And the, probably again, the, the most common thing that you see with a, a ball sport or a contact sport is a dislocated finger. And most of the time it would be to your proximal interphalangeal joint. So basically the knuckle closest to there and Generally speaking, it's a hyperextension, so it tends to get forced backwards. Um, and that in turn can damage a structure called the volar plate, which tends to sit and reinforce that front part of your joint there. Um, so there's a taping technique that I use for that. And again, like with the elbow, you can uh, adapt this particular tape so that if it's purely what we call a collateral ligament of one of the joints, um, again, usually that proximal joint. Um, if I grab his hand now. So, for example, if away for us. So, if I had to protect the joint from being sort of forced that way, I can reinforce that's the inside part of the joint. If it was protecting the joint going the other way, I can do the same technique to protect the other aspect of the joint. So, again, this particular taping, you just tweak around to suit um, where the particular person is damaged. I'll get Josh just to fold that down. Thank you. Okay. So for this one, um, people, if you've got the 12 and a half um, millimetre, 1.25 centimetre rigid tape, I'd use that. You can, if you've got, you know, some uh, 38 mil or even 50 mil in your, in your kit, you can rip that up into to finer pieces. You can use the 25 mil uh, rigid um, for part of this taping. So what I do just for, for demonstration purposes today, I'll just use the 25 and show you how we'll go about uh, protecting uh, the volar plate, a volar plate type injury on, uh, on a finger. So let's start, let's bring that forward a little bit there so you can see. So if we are dealing with the proximal interphalangeal joint, PIP, and often it's, it'll be your ring finger or your middle finger. So I get them to bend their finger a little bit like that. Place 
the rigid tape on with a bent finger. Yeah. Basically put it on like so. All right. So what we're trying to do with this is almost make an artificial roller plate with uh, with the tape as best we can. All right. So just bend a bit more. Get the bend. Okay. Like and bend those down. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So a little bit of tension on there. If, as I said, you've only got your 12 and a half or you've got your 38 mil, it's actually quite easy to tear tape lengthways like this into some strips. Okay, and then we can use these to do the figure eights across the top. So again, slightly bent finger. Start on the back just below his distal interphalangeal joint rather than the proximal. And then you're bringing the tape down like we did with the elbow to cross the front of the joint. So it's like a spiral. And then we do the same with this piece of tape where Bring it down, bend your finger, that's it. Cross over the front of the joint and spiral over the back. So again, if we can just have a look at that up close and then over the other side, you can see it just basically spirals around from the top and then locks over itself on the back. So do a couple of those. A lot harder to do this and show you than it is to do it when you actually just got a hand. Okay, bend your finger a little bit more. That's it. So you want to put a little bit of flexion on that joint so it doesn't bend or does, doesn't straighten out too much. Again, the crisscross. Finishes on the back. And the main thing too here is you actually want to be able to still flex your finger. Can you bend it? Yeah. So you still want to be able to bend it, but you're actually stopping hyper extension and protecting that volar plate. But they can also then be locked. You need to lock those off. Again, you can put a couple little tears in now. 25. And as per some of the other tapes I talked about, not too, certainly not tight on a circumferential tape with rigid. So we just lay that on. And then we do the same down the bottom. And again, preference is if you can finish your tape on the back of someone's finger or the back of their hand, it's much less likely to catch and come off. Okay. So again, you can have a look at where we've gone with that. Okay. So a very acutely injured finger, a very unstable finger that perhaps hasn't gone to a hand therapist and got uh, a rigid splint made for protection. Um, then what we need to do with those is make sure that um, we can actually do that and then perhaps buddy tape this to the next finger as well. Um, one of the things I suppose that I'll, I'll go through too is your preference of your fingers. Um, you know, often the standard buddy tape is whacking two fingers obviously together and there's lots of questions about which combinations that you should do. So my preference is always think about the sport, um, whether the hand's required to catch, how much spread's required on your hand, um, as well as you know, what some people feel more comfortable uh, with it tape one to the other. So generally speaking for a ring finger, I will tape it to the middle finger. If it's an index finger, I'll also tape it to the middle finger. I found that if you try and take the index finger to the thumb, it doesn't work so well. Um, so 
it, the middle finger is generally the one you, you, go, you go to as a splint. Obviously, if the little finger is damaged, then you also get those two um, ring and little finger together as well. All right. So in a very, very acutely um, injured finger, often I'll do this volar plate or um, collateral ligament type setup, and then I'll actually buddy tape those two fingers together as well. So I do a very basic buddy tape, and then I'll show you perhaps what I call a web space uh, tape that we can uh, use in a, in a different situation where perhaps hand spread or even for a, um, we call it metacarpophalangeal joint sprain, um, often the web space type taping is, is a much better option for you. So let's tend for the moment. He's just come off the ground. Um, maybe he's had a subluxation. Often players will put their own finger back in, you know, basically shake it, pull it, drag it like that. Um, so as a, as a trainer or as a physio, um, obviously the main thing we need to make sure of is it hasn't been fractured. So um, if you pull on a fractured finger and try and relocate it, um, you know pretty quickly from the player's reaction, perhaps it's not just a dislocation. Um, and not that I'm advocating everyone goes to put a finger back in. If you have had the training and you haven't got medical people around, um, then perhaps it's something you could consider. Um, but certainly, as I said, it's not something I'm advocating that everyone needs to know how to put fingers back in place. Um, however, if the player's done it themselves and they insist on going back out uh, and they've got a, a sore, swollen finger, then certainly reinforcing uh, the volar plate or the collateral with the rigid tape as a starting point is, is a, good, a good step. Um, what I would then do is, before I buddy tape them together, actually use some uh, Luca foam. So fortunately enough, just got this little scrap sitting around here at the moment. And what we do is if you just try and tape two fingers together, one of them is really quite sore here, and just banging two bony bits together, it's quite uncomfortable. Um, so that's where the Luca foam, I think, works really, really well. So what we're going to do is basically put a piece of Luca foam in the gap between his fingers there. So we give it a little bit of a, a trim so it fits in between the knuckles. And then, of course, depending on how long or fat his fingers are, will depend on how thick you need to make that bit. If he's going back out <clears throat> pardon me, and playing sport, I do tend to take the, uh, obviously, the yellow backing paper off, stick it to his good finger because it's going to be less uncomfortable if I'm pressing that in place than pressing it onto a, a damaged joint. And then I'll then place both his fingers together for the buddy taping. So my preference, bend your fingers just slightly there. Yep. That one. So my preference with these is if you really want to secure a hold, I'll generally use some rigid tape above and below the knuckles. If it's a really nasty, swollen, sore finger, then I think using the 25 millimeter elastic um, is more than, more than suitable. So I'm going to start with elastic tape today. Well, people call yeah, your, your 25 mil or your thumb tape. Just relax that hand a little bit for us. Yep, get those fingers out the way. So starting off below the damaged joint. Don't have to make this super tight. And again, I'm pretty sure most people know how to do the old buddy tape with the finger. Again, just a, wrap, a couple of wraps around and finishing with the tape on the back. And then when we go to the front part of the fingers, same deal, just above the joint and below the tips. So again, if you're a ball contact sport, you need that sort of sensation there for catching 
uh, tackling, things like that. Not the you've got a sore finger like this, you'd want to be grabbing too many jumpers. But again, a couple of times around, like so. And again, just finishing on the back. And then I would certainly lock that one off with some rigid tape. Finishing there. Like that. So again, what you're hoping is that uh, we can still get a little bit of flexion through there, but you're actually protecting that hyperextension or you know, basically that, any of that lateral movement. And usually most people find this pretty comfortable. So just re-emphasise though that if this was an acute sporting injury that you've taped up to get someone back onto the ground, it is imperative that you send or at least advise them to go off and get an X-ray because I have seen quite a number of these where there's either a, a very small avulsion fragment, which, you know, if that's there, just you can reassure someone that, Perhaps it's going to take a little bit longer to settle down than a normal just finger sprain. But they've also, I've also seen a large number of these where there have been a significant enough fragment um, from the dislocation where someone's actually had to go and see a hand specialist, a hand orthopedic surgeon, uh, and have some sort of pins or, or surgery put in place. So certainly it's not something that you want to miss uh, as a, either as a trainer or as a health professional looking after finger injuries and you know if you do have finger specialists that you have access to um, whether it's an OT or a physio who manages finger injuries um, it, again I'd certainly suggest that getting someone along to see someone like that is, is also a very very good idea because that, that way they can be given a, a resting splint or a, a training splint or other sorts of bits and pieces that allow the person to keep protecting that joint over a fairly long period of time, but without perhaps the downside that you might get of keeping someone taped for, you know, could be a period of three to six weeks almost continually. So obviously, again, your skin can get a little bit reactive underneath taping if it's on for a period of time. So the, the thermoplastic splinting is a really great option um, for long-term management of any sort of finger uh, dislocation type injury. Um, one of the things I did also want to talk about just in, in finishing with acute injuries uh, is the other type of injury that you'll often see is some sort of tendon injury or an avulsion type injury. Um, often that'll be a player trying to grab a jump or a Guernsey as, a, as an opponent's running away. Um, sometimes I'll come off and go, I just got a little bit of a funny feeling in my finger. I think I dislocated it. But often when you have a look at it, there's no you know, sign of trauma, no sign of dislocation. But what they've often done is actually ruptured their flexor tendon, which is a tendon that enables you to bend that uh, distal interphalangeal joint. And some of those, if you have a look, sadly I've got some dud fingers, is that one here basically means that I can't fully straighten it because the tendon at the back was ruptured. So my extensor tendon was ruptured in that case. And often that's one where you might get a ball on the end of the finger, which when you're trying to catch something, you've got some tension there and that'll actually pop the tendon off the back. Those ones also, um, you know, obviously if you've been around for a little bit and, and you see these sorts of things, in the ideal world, you know, you, you don't tape them to go back out because often they are associated with a fracture of that distal phalanx um, at the back where the tendon attaches. So these are also ones that you, you don't want to miss. But if you have a player come off complaining of some sort of finger injury and you ask them to actually straighten that 
part there and they can't do it, then you're certainly looking at it highly, highly likely that they've ruptured that extensor tendon. By the same token, someone comes off and you ask them just to try and bend that finger and they can't do that. Same By the same logic, they've probably done something to their flexor tendon. So there's certainly ones you don't sit on and sort of say, see how you are in a couple of weeks' time. I'll just tape it up and uh, send you back out there. Um, there are methods of taping that, but that's certainly well down the track when you're talking about someone coming back from an injury who's been given the all clear by their hand specialist or their orthopaedic guy that they can resume contact sport. Um, and I think what I can do now is just show you uh, briefly that sort of tape. So in that case, what we're going to do, I might grab the other hand, that one's a bit overloaded. So we're going to think about this as being a distal phalanx that maybe we want to stop from being forced backwards. So start with this one. Very much similar to the other ones that we've done already today. But what we're going to do is we actually want to stop him being, if it's an extensor tendon, we want to stop him being forced into flexion. So the tape can be quite simply up and over, pull him into extension. And then you go through that same process of the figure eights. of this time starting on the front of his finger, crossing over the back of the joint. Like we did with the volar plate taping. Okay, so you can put a couple of those on and we don't need to worry about what, you know, crossing over this joint. Um, it's all about protecting that from being forced into flexion, which you can see even with that much tape, that's as much as I can do. So that's quite a protective tape. Um, and a very simple one to do. And again, principle applies the other way. If you're trying to stop someone from being forced backwards, you can actually pull them into a little bit of flexion. All right. So the main one I wanted to talk about um, just before we finish up today is that webbing tape. So sort of got a little bit of bad press about people, perhaps uh, opponents being able to use this as a weapon against someone. Um, in all my years of doing it, I've never seen someone do that to someone. Um, you'd have to be pretty good and pretty accurate with your finger placement if you're going to try and rip someone's fingers off using the tape. So this is generally one for a metacarpophalangeal joint, and often it's to stop a finger that may have gone, got caught and gone sideways. Most frequently, it's a little finger. So you get a very sloppy uh, ligament sprain occurred through here and not managed properly, these ones are actually quite painful and often recur quite frequently because this gets caught all the time with things that people do in, in contact sport. So for this particular tape, what I tend to do is if someone needs a bit of spread on their hands to catch a ball, then you actually can do keep their fingers apart a little bit from this one place the tape around and actually pinch it back together. Like so. In between, like that. And then use a second piece of tape to make sure this doesn't come apart. And this is a tricky bit. And if your eyes are starting to fail a little bit like mine, you might need glasses to do this or put on a uh, magnifying glass or something. But basically thread the needle like that, wrap the tape around a couple of times. And basically that will not, it cannot pull those fingers apart. As I said, the big knock on this tape often was that people thought someone would get their finger, or pain and get their finger in there and just rip them but I think it's going to do more damage to your opponent than it is to your two fingers being stuck together like this. If it's a particularly bad one, you can do this in two layers. So I could do one below these joints as well, 
then makes the risk of actually getting someone else's finger caught in that even, even lower. All right, so that's pretty much all I wanted to go through today. So just to recap, we did uh, the elbow tape using uh, the, the 10 centimetre um, Luco wrap as a protecting the skin, using your 50 or your 38 millimetre rigid tape to protect the joint either into hyperextension or to protect the medial side. And it's just adapting the tape to whatever structures you're trying to protect and then overwrapping it with your 75 mil EAB and just locking that off with some rigid tape to uh, stop it unraveling. We then did the, the uh, wrist tape where we use either the 50 or the 38 millimeter rigid to form a, a wrist block. And that was around about 10 layers of rigid tape folded over on itself, then two or three layers of circumferential tape of rigid, followed by the 75 mil EAB over the top, just to hold everything in place. The last couple of things we finished on was your thumb tape, where we had, uh, as a most common injury, as I said, was more the ulnar collateral ligament, which is on the inside of the thumb here. Um, very difficult to tape without using a thermoplastic guard or splint underneath but then the ones that I have seen a lot in football with either the hyperextension or the radiocollateral ligament tape, um, sorry, injuries where the tape actually works quite well. So we started that off with your uh, 25 centimetre rigid underneath to form a bit of a, a base, overwrap with your standard uh, 25 millimetre thumb or EAB just to hold everything in place, but also to use that to reinforce uh, the, the rigid tape underneath. Um, finally, we moved on to fingers where we had the acute sort of dislocation. And uh, as I said, I really emphasise to everybody that, you know, any dislocation really should be sent off for an X-ray or at least advise people to go off for an X-ray so that you don't miss any, you know, small or sig especially significant fractures. Um, and then we had the, the Luco foam in between just to help give it a bit of protection, a bit of padding. All right. Uh, and then finally, our last one um, was the webbing tape and the mallet type finger tape where you use your 1.25 centimetre or, um, or any of your other rigid tapes that you can actually tear down to the right uh, thickness and use those for taping your fingers. So as I said, I'd open it up to, to questions from now and um, I'll see if I can uh, answer them for you. Okay. So one of the questions I got through is, can you use five mil of foam as the, the block for your wrist extension? Um, look, I think, look, you could. Uh, I don't think it would be quite as effective as there is a degree of, I suppose, give that you'll get in the, the Luca foam that you won't give, won't get by having a number of layers of the rigid tape. So my preference would be if you've got tape there, I me, mean, I would generally use the tape for the wrist block. So I'm just checking questions. Yeah, okay. So we have another question here just talking about treatment for, for tennis or golfer's elbow um, and when, would I use taping in conjunction with other treatment. So, look, again, it's been a while since I've had to treat any uh, tennis or golfer's elbows. However, the principle um, when I was, uh, when I did see a few of these, was actually to use... Um, some rigid tape in a very similar way as you would a, um, I suppose, a, you've seen tennis elbow straps, which are basically uh, a tape that will help deload that lateral, lateral epicondyle and the same with the golfer's elbow to try and deload that common sort of flexor origin. So the principle when we were taping these would be exactly the same um, it's a patella tendon tape where you actually use the tape itself. And I think if I can grab an elbow here. So basically, 
your common extensor origin and you want to just come a little bit below that like a, a tennis elbow tape, uh, sorry, a tennis elbow strap. You don't want to be on the, obviously on the head of his radius here and just be careful of all the neural structures that run around. But, you know, you can actually use rigid tape in a partial circumferential way to try and do the same thing as you might get with a with an elbow uh, an elbow strap. So again, it's just adapting, say, some of the other principles you might pick up, um, and just seeing. At the end of the day, if if it's comfortable, it helps someone relieve their pain, uh, and you can come up with a taping strategy that helps that. Then do it, and uh, you can present next time on the Elasto series with uh, a new tape form that. Uh, can help people with those injuries. I'm just checking if we've got any more questions. Okay. So, look, just to finish up then, um, what I'd like to do is, is just say, look, thanks again to Elasto for putting these uh, series on. Um, we have got the next uh, sessions on the 26th of this month uh, where we're looking at ACL um, rehabilitation. And of course, um, with all the Elasto stuff, if you're a, an individual, you often find Elasto products at your chemist. Um, however, if you're a club, it's better to go to some of your big uh, sports goods suppliers. And we have a very good uh, company here in Perth that helps look after us called APE. And so we'll tend to go and get uh, bulk supplies from them um, to supply our Elastoplast needs. Um, for our sporting teams that we look after. So um, thanks again, everyone. Um, I appreciate your time. And obviously these uh, lectures are uploaded to YouTube for future, uh, I suppose, review. And if you have any other questions, you can certainly send them in via time. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you all later.